All right, so this next thing we're going to cover is Chapter 4. I was We're going to cover most of it. Now, um, I put an assignment up there already, and I even put the chapter book up there. I put that up there earlier today. Let's talk about the assignment real quick. That way I don't have to talk about it at the end. Um, what I want you to find is research some recent vulnerabilities. I want one for each device, okay? So post a single document in the Dropbox for Chapter 4. It needs to include... Your one paragraph synopsis for each vulnerability you find in the link to where you found it. So just real briefly about what you found, just one paragraph. First of all, do you all know what a paragraph is? Three sentences. A couple sentences. It's not 12 pages. It's not one word. It's a couple sentences. And what's a sentence? It has a capitalization, capital letter. And a period at the end, and maybe a couple or, words in it. Or not a period, but some kind of Exactly. It's, it's not like one word. LOL. That's not really a sentence. Okay. Uh, so you should be submitting a paper with four paragraphs and four links. Good? Everybody? There's a lot of them out there. Now, I did say in here, find recent vulnerabilities slash exploits on iPhone, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry. Um, I did modify it a little bit. It says this could include an update to a previous vulnerability or just information on the exploit. The reason is BlackBerry doesn't have that many, so you might not. It's just that it's not being used a lot. So just something recent on a vulnerability in an exploit. There was a new thing today about Android out. There's, there's, like, there's one hourly on Apple. It's not really a vulnerability, but it's crap. But I will but that's what you need to do for Chapter 4. Easy enough. Just find something for that. Okay. Now, uh, up there, you'll see I put the chapter from the book and the presentation from the book. So we're going to go through that real quick here. Well, not real quick. We're going to talk about that today. Okay. I already downloaded them here. In theory. Okay. Enable editing. All right. So this is chapter four. And by the way, I actually uh, was visiting with Eileen this morning. We're thinking about actually combining the wireless and the mobile device security class into one class. The reason for that is, I mean, mobile devices are wireless and pretty much everybody has one. And so actually this is a decent book to do that out of. So it won't happen in the next catalog because it's too late for that. But it will happen sooner or later. So just an update for you. All right, we're going to talk about some evolution of stuff, okay, and how to protect things. And some of this is going to be, um, what can I say, um, repeat information from other classes. But after grading an assignment for another class recently, I realized it wouldn't hurt to hear this again. All right, um, protecting stuff, okay. They, they talk about what are we trying to protect, why are you trying to protect it? All that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, we're, you know, uh, speaking of protecting things, I lived on base. Anyone ever live on Tinker on a military base? You did? Did you lock your doors on your house? Not on base. At base? No. Yeah. See, it was funny because I moved into base housing. I lived there a few years. I don't know, three or four or five years. And when I moved off, I actually had to pay $15 for each key. I think I had two or three keys. Because I had never locked my door. I never used the key. And I went to move off. They're like, where's your keys? I'm like, oh, fine. I ain't used them in four or five years and had to pay for them. But, you know, I felt secure on base. Now, would I do that in my current house? Not so much, okay? And value. I mean, value, you know, like we were talking earlier about the new Apple Watch at $10,000. Is it worth it? No, I don't think so. But every device has value. Um it's funny, uh, a friend of mine that I used to work with a long time ago, that when we had a snow day last week, he was posting that, yeah, I'm sitting at home in the snow watching idiots come to my house to buy crap, old crap on Craigslist. He doesn't throw away anything. He just puts it all on Craigslist. Is anyone else that does that? I've seen a lot of people, like, they'll sell a Tupperware bowl. It's like, seriously? <laughs> you throw that crap away. But it has value to somebody. So, Okay. Who you're protecting it from. Uh, in my neighborhood, uh, someone actually broke in, and, or didn't break in, but stole the trailer yesterday. So after class, i got to go review my recording and uh, try to find it. So, okay. All right, so let's talk about a few things here. Okay. Attackers, external and employees. Which one do you think is the biggest threat? Employees. Let's say employees. Internal 
people, insiders, that kind of stuff. Uh, what was it? There was an article, oh, a few weeks back about a lady who had been fired from Walmart three times for stealing. It's like, why would you keep hiring her back? And they finally said now she's banned for life from Walmart. I mean, it's like, that's crazy. Why would you keep rehiring this person if they keep stealing from you? Okay. All right, they talk about something called least privilege. That's covered in computer security. It's also covered in a couple of Eileen's classes. That means is give you what you need to do to get the job done. Now, I have a master key for this building. So what does a master key normally mean? It unlocks all the doors in this building. Unlocks all the doors. But it does not unlock the maintenance closet. Why? Do I, do I need access to the maintenance closet? No. No. So, you know, even though I have a master key, it still doesn't mean, you know, I have everything. Uh, back prior to the Oasis system we all used, we had something called HP Reflections, which really didn't have any security built in. Which kind of sucks. You know, it was kind of like once you had access, you had access to everything. Okay. So what assets do you think we should protect? In this in this room, for instance, should we protect the projector? What do you think? Is it worth project, protecting? Kind of sort of yeah. because it is, it's got value. It does. How about monitors? How about these monitors on the desk? Well, do we protect our monitors? Yes. Well, Rose State puts stickers on stuff of value. You'll see there's a sticker on the projector. There's no sticker on the monitors. The reason is they have a $500 limit before they consider it important enough to inventory. So if someone steals a whole classroom worth of monitors. Yeah, we're good. Take them home, I guess. But it, it's a. Uh, There's no stickers on them. I know. It's kind of funny. But what they're. I actually brought that up. I'm like, you know, you're giving out all this stuff. Okay. I got iPads. For Donna, for me, for a couple other people, and they were under five hundred dollars. No stickers, so Rose State does not inventory them. It's like, I that's not right. But it, it adds up. That's my point. It adds up. So if I issue everybody in this building an iPad, it's gone. they're gone. You can take it home because we're not going to inventory. So what I do is I keep track of it. Like I gave Ed Wolf an iPad. I don't have a serial number. But I know Ed Wolf got an iPad, and each year I have him sign off that, yes, I still have that iPad. Because it's a valuable item. So that's what's kind of weird. It's really up to your organization. Now, I realize, you know, when I first got hired here, even the keyboards had stickers on them. That gets a little nuts. Okay? When I worked at Tinker, um, uh, I forget what the name of it. There was the, the colonel in charge was the one in charge of all the computer system and typewriters and stuff but we had to do the inventory and he would just sign off on it but i remember remember the old ibm selectric typewriters with the ball that rotated and jumped those were twenty five hundred dollars when they were bought well once we started getting computers what do you think happened to the typewriters they just went in the closet they went to the closet and soon later got thrown away then one day they came out to do an inventory and they were all gone and they're freaking out says someone's paying for these they're twenty five hundred bucks a piece but we're like there's no value to them now so so finally, they realized, okay, even though they cost $2,500 10 years ago, now they have no value, so we don't care anymore. So that, so that does change, okay? And the security measures should be proportional to the value of the asset. So I'm protecting a $10,000 Apple Watch. You hear they're actually going to be storing those in a safe. Is that a good? Yeah, it's a $10,000 watch. You wouldn't want some employee. To, I mean, anyone ever been to the Apple store in Penn Square? Yep. A couple of us. You seen how busy that darn place gets? I could just see them having a ten thousand dollar watch out on the table. That's gonna last five minutes. <laughs> It'd be stolen in a second. So you know, what is the value of the item? What you're protecting? That kind. Of, it's like our desktops here. Even there's really they cost under a thousand dollars. So we have antivirus on them. Do we really need to do that much more? Not really. Okay. Uh, says the key uh, for security purposes, practices, and techniques are aligned with the business. What do we use them for? Okay, so that's kind of a. Right. And what are your goals, objectives? Now, if like I actually got an email just before class saying that tomorrow Rose State's internet's going down campus wide for two hours. I was thinking, I mean, can you imagine our internet goes down for two hours? What do we do? Panic. Luckily, it's going down to 11 p.m. I was like, thank God they picked a time when no one's here. But can you imagine if the internet went down during the day? That would suck. 
Okay. Now, do y'all know, do y'all see all the construction going on outside? You know, they're running new fiber everywhere. Y'all see those cables? They're like this massive, huge, I don't know what the hell's in there, but, okay. Do you think they'll call before they dig? <laughs> I'm assuming they already did. Hopefully they already did, because they're digging everywhere right now. So. I mean, like, when they, if, after they're installed. Oh, they're going to be installed before August, most likely over the summer. Like, our building, May 1st, we're out of here, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Our building closes. Where are we going? Are we going to Humanities? We don't know yet. But May 1st, we leave here. April 1st, we get the second floor back. Not April, I'm sorry. August 1st, we get the second floor back. August 15th, we get the first floor back. So, it's crazy. Okay. All right, here is one part that we actually cover a portion of it in every class. And I actually put it on the computer security cryptography test, and multiple people got it wrong. I was like, seriously? How can you get... Confidentiality. It says preventing unauthorized disclosure of information. You shouldn't just put student records out for people to see. Integrity. Preventing unauthorized modification and availability. Those are three big, biggies. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Availability is becoming more and more important as of late because everything's online now. You can't really do much without Internet access. So. But those are the three biggies. You'll see those in every class. And it does not stand for the Central Intelligence Agency. I actually asked, what does that stand for? And I had, it was multiple choice. So you could have seen the correct one. On the, quite a few people picked Central Intelligence Agency. I'm like, seriously? I did say as it pertains to this course, too. I didn't. But, okay. but accountability is a new one. Okay? That's becoming more and more important now. Accountability, it says making users accountability for their actions. What did they do? Okay? As students, you guys take tests. It never fails with every time I give a test, somebody has a problem. My computer went down, my internet screwed up, you know, and I always have to research it. Like a guy the other day said, hey, I was in there taking the test, my computer locked up, I couldn't complete the test. What am I going to do? As far as we can tell, I never even logged into the test. So I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but we can see when you open the test, we can see when you save a question, we can see all that stuff. But really, we couldn't even see where he did anything. So it, I just think he forgot about it, I tried to give us some darn excuse. But okay. But accountability is a big deal now, especially with email, stuff like that. Non-repudiation, that's covered in a couple classes. I know you did it because of this. Now that... Well, it says preventing the denial that an action has been taken. But say I leave my computer logged in downstairs. And you guys walked up and sat at my desk and did something. As me. It would be pretty hard to say that I didn't do it because it would happen on my computer. So non-repudiation is important, but is not always clear-cut. Okay, Like my phone here. Um, you know, my phone, I leave sit on my desk quite often. Let me find you a picture here. I know those people online won't be able to see it, but um, come on, where are you? Well, i got to find this picture. you got to see this. Maybe I, maybe I can't show it to you. I have too many gas stations and Sonics in here. <laughs> I've eaten at Sonic every day for the last two weeks. Okay. All right. Oh, here it is. Um, every day I look at my phone, I find these on my phone. <laughs> Some of you can see that. It's Roy and Cameron just um, taking pictures on my phone. Now... You think about it, it's my phone, it's locked with a passcode, so really you could say that Ken Dewey took that picture. But Ken Dewey really didn't take that picture because my phone was sitting on my desk. So my point is non-repudiation is not always clear-cut. It's not always, well, it happened from Ken Dewey's phone. Well, how do we know Ken Dewey didn't leave his phone on the desk unlocked? So, kind well, of a... Even with the Apple, you can still take pictures with your phone right. locked. And after you take so many pictures with the phone locked, it automatically unlocks the phone. Right. It's, it's very... And you I can mean, even reply to certain messages to a, to an extent. That is technically a vulnerability. Right. Oh, definitely. definitely. Because if I can, I can take like 40 pictures of his feet until my phone finally... Hmm. Yeah, I've never phone. tried that. I need to try that. I need to have Roy take a billion pictures of my phone and see... Not billion, but... 
Quite a few. Let's see because that. I've unlocked my husband's phone just by playing with the camera. Now, your f fingerprint's not in the phone? Not in his, no. Okay. See, I have my fingerprint's in my wife's phone, and her fingerprint's, fingerprint's in mine. not on mine. Huh. And you know it's the password to oh, it. Oh, okay. it, yeah. It, I mean, we play with the vulnerabilities just because it's right. fun. So, so non-repudiation is not always that clear cut, okay? We talked about all these already, okay? Confidentiality, integrity, availability, and then accountability. With accountability, there's audit trails, there's logs. Um, those are very important right now. Uh, way back when I worked at Tinker in the land shop, does anyone know how a server works? You know, you know how in Linux there's an uptime where you can see how long the machine's been running? You all know Windows doesn't have that? So they actually asked me one day, says, how can we see how long this machine's been running? I said, well, technically, there's an, an event log 605, 6005 and 6009 that are generated whenever a machine's rebooted. So we could basically see how long it's been since the machine was rebooted, rebooted. That's all I could think of a way to figure out how long this machine's been up and running. So I went in there to the server to look at the event logs, and they were all gone. Well, they kept saying, oh, yeah, they kept filling up, so we just delete them every morning. Wow, what good is that? It's like <laughs> audit logs are important. Um, you know, it's and uh, yeah, I don't know. I might. I don't think I told this class. Uh, I was I was put into the networking shop at Tinker. I was kind of forced there by this captain and this colonel. They didn't want me there, but I was stuck there. But and I was I had the education. They didn't. And then they were always, if you're so smart, figure this out. Well, one day they came and got me. They said, hey. This guy that was discharged dishonorably from the military has been breaking into the colonel's calendar, and into the colonel's machine. I'm like, what? I said, oh, yeah, this Sergeant so-and-so, whatever his name was, has been discharged, you know, three months ago, and he's been breaking in and editing the colonel's calendar. We're like, it didn't make any sense to me. And, and so one day they came and got me, and they're like, all right, he's in there right now. You need to tell us what the hell's going on since you're so smart. So I went in and I look at the audit log and it says Sergeant So and So's computer is editing the calendar. Do you all know how it works? You got a computer name, and you have a computer description. In the event log, the description is what appears. So what they had done was they took that guy's computer, gave it to the colonel. Didn't change the computer description. So really what it was, was the colonel was editing his own calendar, but it was saying that Sergeant so-and-so was editing it. Because I looked at it, I, said, I showed him, I says, you know, because it showed the sergeant's name, but then it showed the machine name. I said, that's actually the colonel's machine number, machine name, but it just has the sergeant. So we went in there and looked, sure enough, they didn't change the description. So audit logs are only good as the information they store. And if you don't, and it's like your phone. Y'all know you change the name of your phone? Yeah, it's not that hard. And my big issue is, I still do it today, don't call it your new iPhone. Why would that be bad? Because it means you have more than one. Or next year you got the new, new iPhone or the new, new, newer iPhone. So you understand where I'm going? Yeah. It's a new iPhone. It's like new laptop. Okay. Next year, is it the new, new laptop? So I try to put, you know, like iPhone 6 now or fall 2013 laptop, stuff like that. So it's easier to see. But audit trail is kind of a big deal. So when, they, when should it be deleted? When should logs in the lab be deleted? Anyone know? It really depends on the use case. If you're working on a top secret network, never. Your home logs, hell, whenever you feel like it. But just remember, once you delete them, the next day you're going to need them. It never fails. Every time. Okay. You know, I was reading this in there. They go into a little more depth on email read receipts. Y'all know what read receipts are, don't you? They, yeah. They, they suck. <laughs> they don't it really lets work. The person, know you, the person who right. sends it know you read it. Right, but do I have... I mean, so you send me an email with a read receipt on it. It pops up and says, do you want to send them a receipt? No. Okay, you never, never get the read receipts. <laughs> So you really only get the read receipt if I want to say that I read it. It's stupid. I don't think it's very good. Now, digital signatures, on the other hand, those are better. Okay. All right.
let's talk about a couple of other things. Data theft, okay? Personally identifiable information, anything about you, okay? I give a little speech to high schoolers. I went out to Deerfield, what, two weeks ago and spoke to a couple hundred seventh graders. Do you all know what you should put on Facebook? Nothing. <laughs> Pretty much nothing would be the correct answer. What do people put up there? Everything. Everything. My niece, you know, tried to steal my identity when she lived here, but went back to Connecticut, ended up moving to California, hadn't talked to her since she left here, yet I know all of her information where she lived in California, I knew who she dated, I knew everything. Cell phone number, because she puts it all on Facebook. Not a very good idea. Bank accounts, you know, and, uh, we had another student uh, works for uh, NSA up in D.C. You'd think they would be real big on stuff. But it was funny because he had posted on his Facebook page, all right, heading out, climbing on whatever the cruise ship name is. I'll be seeing you in a week. So I replied back with, great, it means your house is abandoned. I'll be there to rob it in a few minutes. You know, why would you put this stuff on there? Because people don't realize that their friends. Might not be their friends. Right. So, all right. Yeah, and it's all yeah, like, wow. oh, look, you know, you, just... you got the friend who likes everything you post, yeah. whatever it is. Like, <laughs> like, like, it's like, yeah. stupid. Okay. But their friend's account could be compromised. Exactly. You could just gave Joe Schmo over here who's an experienced bank robber. Yeah, now that you're not home. Now he knows exactly where you live because you have your house pinpointed on, like, at my casa. And yes. Well, if you, is anyone in the security auditing class? No. Well, you, you, you're doing an assignment, which basically is stalking me. They have to find 25 things about me. So I actually was very weary about giving that assignment, but... We, we do know where you live because if we go review one of Oh, I, I have my house in the videos and everything. So. But I do have, you know, I want to get, you know the signs, security signs you have in your house? I want to make one up. It says, I haven't done it yet. It's going to say, this house has 16 cameras. Nine of them are currently working. Five of them are actively recording 24-7. You figure out which one. So, you know. Makes sense. You don't know. At any, any given point, my students know exactly what's going on. At this okay, place. but you know, people want to find out bank account information, personal information. All just you have to all do for that stuff. crap is just go buy a copier from your cop from the copy place. Yeah, I mean, I, if I, they haven't been cleared. Nowadays, they're clearing them all. Like our copier here, the moment you copy or scan something, it comes out and says, "Job data being cleared." Not, but not all of them. Yeah, not all of them. Not all of them want to pay right. that five hundred dollars for that. Extra. That feature, mm -hmm. so then you could go buy something from the, the yeah. sex crimes department or the narcotics department, just buy a used copy nice. for 300 bucks, and voila, you have everybody's there you go. information. All right, uh, remote access software. There's so much of that stuff installed on a lot. Y'all see the, the latest Android phone? It's iX or whatever the heck the name was. It's actually shipping with malware in it. Y'all see that came out this week? It was? They're actually shipping this brand new phone. It's coming out already has malware installed from the manufacturer. Yeah, when you research, it came out, it was earlier this week, or maybe it was the end of last week. But the phone is actually infected with malware already. Wow. Can you imagine if you reset it all? Oh, you get reset it back to the virus again. Why? Someone broke into the manufacturing process and installed it. That's insane. I know, it's, it's crazy. Okay. That sounds like a challenge. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. If y'all look, you'll see there's a new article that came out. It was either the beginning of this week or the end of the last week. It was already shipping with malware. There was an IBM laptop years ago that did the same thing. So do they recall all those phones? Probably not. They're going to sell them cheaper. <laughs> sell them cheaper. Okay. Access to data and phone service. You know, people could be using your phone. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Okay. Sniffing, snooping, malware, browser exploits. There's just all kinds of them out there. Um, there was a new one came out this morning. There's a new phishing attempt, which I haven't read yet, about the Apple Watch. I don't know what it is, but it's a brand new one. So I'm assuming someone's probably out there saying, hey, you know, looks like you could get this watch. Do you want to reserve it now? So I don't know, but I just saw it right before class. A brand new one about a phishing attempt based on the Apple Watch. So it's, okay, 
That's crazy. How about lost or stolen devices? Okay. Do you all know you can wipe your devices? Android supports that now, don't they? Yeah, they do it. What are you doing here? I got fired. Sweet. Finally, somebody woke up. <laughs> I don't care if you sit in there. <laughs> but, um, so Android can remotely wipe now and everything? Yeah. You can okay. okay. Now, aren't isn't there a law where they actually have to install that by default now, in like California at least? Uh, I think so. I heard it's on the there was something where Android is going to have to ship with that enabled, just like Apple does. Nice. Nice. You all know the most of them have two-party authentication now and all that, two-factor authentication, even Apple iCloud. You all know what that is, I hope. And whenever you used it, two-factor authentication is like you go to log into your Gmail, and on your phone there's a authenticator, and it gives you a code. It's not really a text. Let me see if I can find mine real quick. Yeah, but, but the question, there it is. Here's my Google Authenticator. Actually, I don't, I don't think, no, I don't have it currently set up. But what's nice about it is, like, I was worried that when I went on a cruise, how could I check my email if I can't get that text? But the authenticator actually still works even when your phone's offline. So it's kind of cool. Worked good. Okay. All right. Um, this is kind of fun. Anyone ever, anyone ever been to an airport and saw a free wireless network? You know, they're never, that's never the right one. What people do is they'll create a wireless network with the same name or a similar name. They're never the right one. It's uh, yeah, it's called free public Wi-Fi. That's the one. Free public Wi-Fi is never what you should connect to. Like Orlando, they have free internet at the airport. But there's also free public Wi-Fi. It's everywhere. Don't ever connect to it because it's never free. It's always somebody trying to get your stuff. So don't ever do it. Okay. Bluetooth hacks, there's a lot of those. NFC, there's a lot of issues even the apple pay has issues now they all do you know it's funny people are complaining about that but hell google's had problems every single person that's implemented it has had issues with it okay denial of service you know preventing you from doing anything okay there's the evil twin access points so an access point is set to the same network name as a legitimate one fooling you into connecting to it i was down in uh Austin. I don't know if you know this, but the city of Austin, Texas, they actually have free internet in the entire city. Well, I stayed in the hotel, this big hotel for a conference. And then it was like 10 bucks a day. So I went down to the desk. I'm like, why are you charging me for internet when it's free in the city? Oh, but ours is better, blah, blah, blah. Well, I did was open my window and then I was able to connect to the free internet and use it. It was, it was crazy. But a lot of places do that. They'll have, you know, but next time you go to the airport, look for free public Wi-Fi. And if your phone tells you, it'll probably tell you it's in ad hoc mode, which is normally phone to phone, rather than infrastructure is what you want. So kind of kind of funny stuff. Okay. All right. All right. Risk mitigation. Uh, CNSS certification 4016 is all about risk. Risk is a big deal. Uh, do you all leave location services turned on for your phone, your pictures? Anyway, I leave mine on all the time. So is it a vulnerability thing? Yes. Why? What? It's a way, a, when you upload it onto Facebook or mm -hmm. wherever, someone can download it and, and see get where it was actual at. actual GPS locations. She's absolutely true. And I was thinking, man, should I turn that off? But I'd like to be able to see where I took that picture. But there is... A potential vulnerability because uh, well, hell, it was there was an article a few months back about this guy who was taking pictures when he was doing some illegal acts, and the FBI kept tracking him based on his pictures he kept posting because he had the GPS enabled. It's like you're an idiot. Christmas time is when thieves use that. Most. Yeah. So, so moral of the story is you're going to do illegal acts, turn off the GPS locations, therefore they can't track you. There you go, as easily. Okay. How about locking your phone? Yeah, obviously I have a lock on mine now. Does everybody have a lock on there? Yes. Do you use a simple password? Or do you yes, I do. I have a simple password. password. I do have a simple password. Now, tisk, tisk. but prior to the Touch ID, I didn't lock my phone. Unless I was planning on leaving my phone somewhere. 
because I was too lazy to enter the number. I'm just telling you, that's the way it is. But was I willing to accept the risk? Yes, I was. So it's one of those things, you know, as long as you make the... Now, see, I know better, and I know the risk, but what about the person who doesn't know better? What about the old grandma who's just using the phone for whatever, you know, they don't know. Facebook, some candy crush. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's my mother-in-law right now. Okay. Uh, remote locks, remote wipe, everybody does that now. Mobile GPS data, that's obviously amazing. Um, I was actually looking at the GPS data from my phone the other day, and it was funny because um, there was a an island out in... Uh, out east, kind of near Bahamas area. I had never been to. And yet, there's a bunch of pictures that say I was at this island. Well, what it was is I was on a cruise ship, and it was, the pictures were actually on the cruise ship, but somehow they all showed the location as being that island. What I'm wondering if the cruise ship wasn't relaying the data through that island, you know, through their internet connection. Because it's like, I would never been there, because I was looking for a cruise, I, forget, I think it was Grand Turk Island, whatever it was at. And it's like, I've never been there, yet my GPS says I have all these pictures from there. And I go to look at them, and they're not actually from there. So it's not always perfect. And you guys know now that you can actually change dates on phones, and but GPS is different. So, All right. Uh, stored data encryption. Did you all read the article yesterday about CIA trying to break Apple's encryption? Yeah. yeah. They've been trying to break that for years. I. It kind of makes it sound like they did break it, but I'm not totally sure. But, like, there's, I think, the White Hat Convention that takes over in Japan or whatever. They took two-stage two step, two process to be able to break the Apple encryption or to be able to hack into the Apple. They had to go in through the Bluetooth of all things. Oh. Well, I'm going to a conference in uh, Vegas here soon, uh, May, and I just signed up for a... Uh, is that the Black Hat? No, this is actually uh, from Encase. I'm going to their updated mobile forensics one, plus I'm going into the uh, vehicle forensics, car stuff. That's what I heard last year, because you know when you sync your phone up with a car, it actually stores all your data decrypted on the car? So I want to see if that's been updated, if there's anything on that. So I signed up for all this cool stuff, so it'll be good. All right, uh, mobile device management. So if Rose State issued me this phone, which they didn't, but if they did, It'd be nice if they had the ability to wipe it and lock it and do all that stuff, which a lot of them do now. Most of them do, so which is nice. It allows your administrators to manage it remotely, so which is very nice. Sends over the air signals to devices to do all kinds of stuff with them. Now, um, y'all know what a Faraday cage is? Some of you know what a Faraday cage is? It's a think of it like a chicken coop is a prime example. There was a Enemy of the State movie with uh, Gene Hackman where he's in a Faraday cage for everything he does because he doesn't want the government to get into his stuff. Uh, what a Faraday cage, it blocks all signals in and out. Uh, when I was at the uh, regional forensics laboratory in Louisville, Kentucky, a couple years ago, they had a Faraday bag. They had someone who actually sewn a bag. It was like a knapsack made out of the metallic material, but it was so fine you could see through it. And what they would do is they would take their phones and put it in the bag, turn the phones on, and those signals could get around. So I actually did it with my phone. I had my phone with me, and I had a perfect signal on my phone. Put it in the bag, they wrapped it up around my arm, then all of a sudden I have no signal. So it prevents the signal. And the reason they do that is they say they never turn on any device unless it's inside of a Faraday cage. Because, you know... If I lose my phone and it's turned off or powered off or something, I could remotely send a wipe signal to it. And the next time it gets turned on is when it would actually take effect. So the FBI, they don't ever turn phones on out in the open to prevent that from happening. So, kind of cool. So businesses use those Faraday cages in their uh, server rooms. Yes, they do. A lot, to prevent a lot of them. In a, I, think I told you my stepdaughter took her phone to school. And she wasn't supposed to be using it. So what I did is I remotely locked it and gave her the password in the text. So the password was 1234. Then I knew the moment she unlocked it because I got the message saying the phone was unlocked. But you're right, a lot of places do that. They actually have Faraday paint now yeah. where you can paint your buildings. Heck, our uh, faculty lounge downstairs has a metallic coating on the window. Our signal sucks. You open the wind, open the door and you get perfect signal. So. My car's that way. Yeah. I've got tinting on the, the tinting. windows that's got the metalized tint. Yeah. 
if you Sucks. get my car, you can't get a signal when it's cracked. Yeah, in my house, same way. I have the uh, triple pane argon filled windows. They suck. I have to go stand at my front door to get a good cell signal because through my windows it doesn't work. It sucks. Okay. Yeah, well, I wish AT&T did. I do have a repeater in my house. It just doesn't work all that great. Okay. Mobile application management. Administrators can manage your phones now. They can install applications. They can do all kinds of stuff. Kind of cool. A lot of stuff going on in that area. Desktop virtualization. They talked about the whole bring your device. Um, desktop virtualization is kind of like vSphere. When you guys log in, you get a machine that has everything installed on it. Actually, uh, prior company I used to take care of, Chapel Supply, sells pressure washers and stuff like that. They put their whole company doing that. Where All they had on their desk was it was called a WISE terminal, I guess, which was a keyboard, mouse, and monitor connected to the network. And it connected to the server, and then they did everything via a virtual desktop. They weren't pleased with it because they didn't, they lost the, basically the horsepower. So since everything's being done on the server, their server wasn't big enough, so it kind of screwed it up, okay? But desktop virtualization is a nice way to do it. You can actually remotely get in and do stuff on your phone and do stuff forever, okay? All right, physical control is kind of important. You need to lock doors, that kind of stuff, okay? Camera is important as well. Um, like we have, you know, camera at each door in this building. I don't think that's enough, but that's what we currently have, Okay. Security gates, fences, obviously important as well. So physical, what, what's the saying? Without physical security, you have no security. I taught a network admin class where I had students save a file on their hard drive and told them that they could, you know, put a password on it, do it, anything they want to do with it. And I said, if you can make it where I cannot read your file within five minutes, you get extra credit on the test. So everybody was putting passwords on and doing all kinds of stuff. Then they all went home. Well, at that time, we had removable drives in their machines. I just pulled out each drive, stuck it in the instructor machine. Since it's on a different machine, all the security settings are null and void on their drive. I opened up every one of the files. And one of the students says, that's unfair. You know, why didn't you let us take it home? I just I never asked. <laughs> if you had taken it home, you would have been secure. But can't but. you, couldn't they have, like, got, gotten their files where it was locked to where it would only open they would, that's if they were encrypting it with, um, I, I don't think we use, we had EFS. I don't know if I let them use EFS on there. But right, they could have encrypted it with a key of some sort, but they didn't do that, okay? Technical controllers, that could be our antivirus, you know, our firewalls, our host intrusion. You know, I have such big hard drives in my machine downstairs. They, they like to do a full scan every day. In my opinion, that's stupid. Well, my full skin takes too long, so my full skin starts Sunday afternoon and is never done by Monday morning. I always have to stop the scan. But I had to get special permission for that because the normal user on Rose's network can't stop the scan. And I have, like, you know, multiple terabytes of drives, and it takes too long and never finishes, okay? Network intrusion detection, uh, kind of nice. And we, you know, our, even our uh, wireless system here at Rose State, Brad's always walking through looking for machines. He can actually detect when someone turns on a rogue access point and stuff like that. So, kind of nice, okay? Policies and procedures. Another thing that's very important, but how many places actually do that? Does all your companies have policies in place that are adhered to? Very loose. Yeah, they're very it's loose. Written, but nobody really exactly. Them. And if they're written, are they reviewed? Are they updated? Yeah. Probably not. Uh, I had to re get all of ours redone, and we have a policy committee that hasn't met since 2008. Even the minutes say, you know, the next meeting date, whatever, will be soon or something like that. So basically, they finally got rid of the committee since it was a meeting. But I told them, I said, you really need to get your policies updated, and they need to have a clear-cut revision time period. So Brad went up and modified them all so they... So they were all reviewed December 2014. They'll be reviewed again next December. So getting policies in place and used are, is tough, okay? And they always see this picture. You need training, then physical, then so on and so forth, all the way into the application layer. Okay, even with that, you can still have issues, okay? We're not going to go into all these in depth, uh, but you know, there's a lot because we're running out of time, okay? Okay, authentication. 
So what do you all feel about the whole fingerprint thing on my phone? Is that good? I like it on my phone. So I got is, it, Samsung. is it secure? Actually, you're right. You could. You could see it if you could copy it off of there. Um, I would say it's better than nothing. Yeah. It's going to prevent most issues. But is it foolproof? Definitely not. No. Uh, I had the old Microsoft fingerprint scanner. Um, it was funny because my son, my youngest, he's now 26, I guess, <laughs> he comes up to it, takes a blank piece of paper. You know, he looked at it. He could see my fingerprint on it. So you took a blank white piece of paper, slapped it on top of it, let him write in. Because it just detected the paper there, which then read the fingerprint that was on the glass and let him write in. I'm like, you suck. So that didn't last long. So but authentication, you know, who are you? You know, and it, so authorization, who can do what? It's always based on users, groups, and that's more in another class. But what are you authorized to do? And then are you accountable for what you're doing? Okay. Actually, you know, we kind of along the same way here. Actually, it really goes to logging. Uh, you would not believe how many students contact Rose State and said, you know, I tried to drop my class on whatever day before we charged money or something, and it wouldn't work. So many times we had to go through, look, you, there's no evidence you ever tried to drop your class. So, so it's funny. That works. Okay. Context sensitive. It says providing greater granularity in access controls. I think they're getting a little too much in some point. Okay. Um, I was using something the other day. What the heck was it? Um, there was something that the, the settings on there were crazy. It's kind of like, oh, what the hell was it? What application was that? I can't remember what it was. But it, it makes it so it's very detailed, where so you could read or write or execute plus 20 levels beyond. It's, that's, it's kind of like the new D2L. You know, they keep adding new capabilities to it, what we can do, what we can't do, what students can do, what we can't see. And they're all based on normally a login, but can be based on groups. Actually, uh, I teach for Park okay. University, and they're switching over to Canvas, the one we tried last year, which sucked. Mm -hmm. They're switching over to that. And it's funny because as an instructor for them, you would think I would have instructor permissions. I don't. I have teaching assistant permissions. What the reason is, the Park University is real big on they get their classes approved, then everybody teaches the same thing. So, so I'm not actually the one who makes their classes. But then no one can change them. But by an instructor, I could change it. So we all have teaching assistant permissions. That way we can administer the class, but we can't change the class. So it's it's very granular. On it's funny because we they actually sent me an email. So okay, you need to go update your bio. Well, they put it on a page, and the teaching assistant can't update the bio. So it, it's just a nightmare. Like, can okay, you want me to update this? Yet yeah, I don't have the permissions to update it. So it's going to be fun. So all right. Firewalls are the same way. They can do all kinds of different things now. We're actually getting an entire new firewall system here at Rose State. All new routers, all new everything here this summer. So that's going to change. We're actually going to be going to, is it 100 gigabit? It's either 100 gigabit or 10 gigabit. It's got to be 100 at every you know building. So it's going to be nice. So it should be, even the vSphere should be a whole bunch faster. Okay. We're almost done with this chapter. Okay. Um, so once security devices are authenticated and authorize you, then they, you know, they need to be in place to protect it. You know, the same stuff we already talked about. There are a couple standards which we're going to briefly touch on. Okay. Okay. Eileen's class is normally covers the standards, but we're going to talk about them a little bit here. So ISO 27001 says provide requirements for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continuing improvements to information security. Does that mean you have to follow this stuff? No. As an organization, you don't have to, but they would like you to. Okay. It goes on what they call here the Plan, Do, Check, Act, and it's a thing that keeps going around. Okay. So that's that standard. Okay. And they talk about the the, the updated the the other one was the two the zero one. This is the zero two. They have different areas and different controls in place, and they actually show you a list of them here. 
asset management, cryptography. You know, what good is cryptography if you don't use it? Someone actually posted the other day, they do not know why websites are still unsecure. Do you think every website needs to be encrypted? I don't think so because it slows them down. But with the speed of Internet nowadays, is it, would it be a bad thing if they were encrypted? Not necessarily, but does everything have to be? I, I don't know. But how is, how is net neutrality going to affect all of that? Yeah. That's the big thing. Right, you don't know. So, you know. yeah, if everything was encrypted, yes, we would be somewhat safer. But that's going to raise costs. It's going to raise costs on data. It's going to raise costs on even management. Because we're going to need, you know, hell, an uh, encryption key, an SSL certificate, when, through uh, VeriSign was $349. I don't know what that costs now, but can you imagine if every website had to have one now? And some places would have to have multiple. That would get expensive. So, But they tell you that basically policies in all these areas. Okay. SP, special publication, stands for 800-53, Security and Privacy Controls on Federal Information Systems. These are things that are made by NIST, which is National Institute of Standards. That's where I went two years ago. And it tells your organization what you should be doing, and hopefully you follow a lot of these. Okay, Sarbanes-Oxley says enacted to address investor confidence. Okay, so you know, it's basically reporting stuff. It came about, it got popular when uh, Enron had their issue. Graham Leach says to purpose to secure and protect personally identifiable information. It's kind of part like what the HIPAA is. No, there's something called a directory of personal information. Um, it's like we cannot store your student ID and a certain other pieces of information in the same table, for instance, or in the same area or in the same directory. It's kind of it's kind of weird the way all that works. HIPAA, that's hospitals. Everybody knows all about HIPAA. Yep. Hate it, but you know it was funny. My my youngest, when he turned 18, he was actually living out in Arizona. He called me up. He was so sick. And, you know, I have TRICARE, so he could see a doctor in Arizona. Uh, he called me and said, Dad, I'm dying. You need to get me an appointment to go see a doctor. And since his actual main doctor was here, we just had to get them to approve him to see a doctor in Arizona. So I called Tinker and said, hey, son's sick. How old is he? He said, 18. Can't talk to you. Because the moment he turned 18, he's an adult. I can no longer miss. So I called my son and said, dude, I can't help you. You have to go, oh, please just do it for me. He says, I can't. Now you're an adult. I can no longer help you. So he had to call the doctor, and he wasn't happy. But that's the way it works nowadays. Okay, But that's changing so much. There's, you know, if, if you watch the deal, the new Apple thing about the research kit, they're starting to implement a big deal. Uh, like, for instance, Roy. You all know Roy. Roy's been in here. Roy has real bad asthma. Okay, So he might see the doctor once or twice a year. What if we could actually keep track of his asthma issues every day or maybe every hour or every minute? They were saying on the little blurb they put out there that this one company sent out hundreds of thousands of letters for information about diseases that people had, and I think they received 200 back. That's a very low percentage. So what they're saying is what if they could build applications that people could actually report easily? You know, would it hurt anybody for me to report Blood pressure information? No, it wouldn't hurt me, as long as it was just being stored as blood pressure information for the results of a study. So, but, but this is changing a whole bunch. There's going to be a lot more issues with it in the near future. Okay. PCI compliance totally sucked. What PCI compliance is is the ability to accept credit cards. I worked with a bunch of companies that accepted credit cards, and you have to do a quarterly check to verify you meet standards. But what's very misleading about it is... You just have to tell them. It's like, do you have a firewall? Yes. Do you have this? Yes. Do you have this? Yes. And as you go down the list, if you say no, they're like, sorry, you cannot continue. Yes. So why is it like over in Europe they use on their credit cards like the smart chips? And why do you know it's very few if you want it, you have to ask for it almost over here. I know. It's you know, why do they have four G networks everywhere? They have no more analog anything. They're much quicker to adopt this kind of stuff. See, part of the issue is 
We all think we're the best over here in the United States. We're not. What's it? Three quarters of the world's population lives in China right now. It's crazy. It's you know, we we think we're the only, but we're not. We're actually very far behind on technology. But with the PCI check, really, it's just you saying you have it. Do you encrypt your data? Yes. Do you have a backup? Yes. But you don't have to prove it. So really, you can just say yes to everything, hit submit, and you're done. So it's kind of one of those things that they're taking your word for. It's like our accreditation. They come here every 10 years. We tell them what we do. And they're like, that looks good, and we get accredited. Can you imagine if we said, no, we didn't do something? We wouldn't. That would be stupid. Okay. So it's kind of, you know, PCI is the way it is. But they do now at least do scanning. At least when I took care of those gyms, we had to tell them what we did, and they did an external network scan, which was at least something. Okay. All right. So effects of regulations. A lot of times you don't know the effects until years down the road because things change. Okay. All right. And that's the end of this chapter. Now, one more note on the assignment you have to do. Okay. We're actually going to be talking more about those vulnerabilities next week. I wanted you all to, oh, I didn't put a date on it, did I? It's due next week, by the way. Oh, it's due the week after that. <laughs> but that week, after spring break, we're going to be talking more about the vulnerabilities in the area. So I wanted you all to look up some before then. So so even though I said it's for Chapter 4, it's, it's really preparing you for Chapter 5, even though it mentions a little bit in Chapter 4. So, all right, so go find your vulnerabilities, and I'll see you the week after spring break. And I'll update the date on there.